Uh, let me just tell you my initial view, uh, my quick take on, on the question of whether or not IR theory is global enough. I think IR theory is global in the extreme, and I think that this is a wonderful situation. As a good realist, I don't like the phrase global village, right? When I hear the word global village, it makes me nervous. But I do think as an IR scholar, I live in a global village. Uh, I think we all basically speak the same language. And by that, I mean, we talk in terms of the same theories. Uh, and English is the language that everybody speaks who engages in IR theorizing. Uh, you know, when I go to countries like Turkey uh, or Japan or Mexico, uh, invariably after I'm done speaking, my host will ask me the question, how is it different talking to Turkish students or Mexican students from talking to American students about the issue I'm talking on. And I always say, there's no difference at all. I get the same questions everywhere I go. We speak the same language and it's not just English, although it is English, we speak the same theoretical language, right? Uh, I would note to you that I am a terribly unpopular person in the West, uh, but in the non-Western world, I am remarkably popular. Uh, China and Russia are two countries that I can go to where I basically speak the same language in terms of IR theories that most elites in those countries speak. Uh, as many of you have heard me say, I'm sure, when I go to China, I always say when I talk, or I almost always say when I talk, it's nice to be back among my people, right? Now, I don't speak a word of Chinese. I can't even recognize my own name in Chinese. I'm kind of the typical ugly American in that I only speak English. But intellectually, I'm at home in China and I'm at home in Russia when I talk about IR theory, right? Uh, so for me, it is a global village. Uh, and you know, again, the question, is IR theory global enough? Yes, it is very global, and that's wonderful. Now, Owner and Ursel have a different answer. Their answer is, it's not global enough. Uh, now, they agree with me that we all speak the same language, both in terms of English and in terms of the theories that we use. So there's no disagreement between us there. Right. But where they disagree and where they think um, uh, IR is not global enough is that they believe that virtually all the theories are developed in the West, uh, that we have remarkably few, if any, non-Western theories. And they use words like core and periphery as synonyms for Western and non-Western. And their basic view is that in the non-Western world, there are no genuine, this is quoting them, no genuine homegrown theorizing. There is no genuine homegrown theorizing. It's all those Western theories that are basically in their story sort of pushed on the non-Western world, pushed on the periphery. And they talk about dependency theory, and the whole idea is that the non-Western world is dependent on uh, the Western world because the Western world imposes these theories on them. So in a nutshell, that's why Owner and Ursel have a very different answer to the question of whether or not uh, IR is global or not. And again, I say it is uh, global enough, and I say it is, and they say it isn't. Uh, now, I I'd like to talk in more detail about uh, my views on owner and Ursul's piece, and talk about where I agree with them and where I disagree with them. And this will allow me to lay out my own thinking on this issue. 
Uh, just as a starting point, I agree with a lot of what they say. When I read their piece, it wasn't like I was in disagreement from start to finish. On the contrary, I agree with a lot of what they say. We have disagreements, which I'll go into. But uh, first of all, I like their focus on theory. As some of you probably know, I have been given to say that theory is God. So I love theory. I think privileging theory is a good thing. And they privilege theory, right? Uh, and you want to, and this will become clear as we go along, you want to always remember that there's a difference between theory and methods, right? If you get training in methods, that does not mean you're getting training in theory, right? So there's a real tension between theory and methods, and they complement each other as well, but there's a tension there, right? And there's a tension between theory and empirical work, and there's a tension between theory and hypothesis testing. So I put methods, empirical analysis, and hypothesis testing in one basket and theory in the other basket. And I privilege theory and they privilege theory. So we're on the same page there. Uh, I think they're absolutely right about the primacy of the West. This is a Western dominated business. The core dominates the periphery uh, when it comes to developing theories, okay, uh, which is what we're talking about. And I think it's the Anglo-Saxon world, the Americans and the Brits, who dominate within the West and therefore dominate on the planet. Uh, they're obviously right about the primacy of the English language. The mere fact that I'm speaking in English and virtually all of you understand what I'm saying speaks volumes to that point. Uh, they're absolutely right about the primacy of Western journals, you know, getting an article published in the APSR or international security or international organization. This all matters enormously. Um, and they're also right about the primacy of Western universities. Uh, and you see this in two very different ways. First of all, places like Bill Kent and places all over the world emulate, try to imitate Western universities. Uh, and furthermore, some of the best students in countries like Turkey or countries like Mexico, you name your country, uh, in the non-Western world, want to go to the West to get educated. The number of Chinese who want to come to the University of Chicago to study with me is off the charts. Uh, so you have some of the best students in countries in the non-Western world wanting to go get educated in the Western world. And then you have universities in places like China places like Turkey that are imitating Western universities. So I agree with them on all those points. They're right on the money. Where I disagree is um, I don't believe that the core uh, is imposing its theories uh, uh, on the periphery uh, in a malign way. Uh, uh, the use of the word dependency theory uh, as a way of describing what's going on doesn't accord with sort of how I see this. And of course, that's why my little article, my 2016 article I was telling you about up front, is entitled Benign Hegemony. Uh, I think that you could call me somebody who believes in benign hegemony and Owner and Ursel as two people who believe in malign hegemony. Uh, now, let me unpack for you why I disagree with them on this issue. First, what are homegrown theories, right? In other words, th this is their word, homegrown theories. Homegrown theories are theories that are developed in the periphery uh, or in the non-Western world. And I think that you have to tell me what the specific characteristics are of those theories that differentiate them from, let's say, Western theories. I don't even like the word Western theories because in my brain, theories are just theories. Uh, theories are just generalizable statements about cause and effect, if this, then that. They're, I don't see them as uh, something that 
uh, applies to a specific region or comes from a specific region. Uh, just to take realism, for example, realism is a general theory, right, that applies in countries like Turkey. You could use it to explain American, uh, Turkish foreign policy. You can use it to explain Chinese foreign policy. How far it takes you is debatable. But I, I don't know what a homegrown theory would be. Realism certainly not a homegrown theory. It was invented in the West, but it could have easily been invented uh, in Turkey uh, or in Japan or in Mexico. Uh, uh, I mean, if the circumstances were different, uh, it just happened that it was invented in Europe. It wasn't even invented in the United States. When we talk about the Anglo-Saxon world, right? The Germans were way out ahead of the Americans in terms of developing basic realist theory. Uh, and also just the subjects that we study. I mean, take nuclear proliferation. People in the non-Western world are interested in nuclear proliferation. If you're Turkish and you're looking at Iran and what Iran is doing on the nuclear front and what Saudi Arabia has said it would do in response to Iran developing nuclear weapons, and you start to theorize about nuclear proliferation, uh, is there going to be a homegrown theory? Is, are Turks going to come up with a homegrown theory that is different than the theories that are out there? Maybe, but you have to tell me what a homegrown theory looks like. Uh, just has to be defined. And, and I don't see that. And I can't sort of invent an argument for myself as to what a homegrown theory looks like. Second point I'd make is, where are the homegrown theories that have been sidelined? In, in other words, if we live in a world where you have sort of this imperial Anglo-Saxon world that wants to dominate and wants to keep homegrown theories down, uh, where are the homegrown theories that are being kept down? Uh, I don't think that uh, owner or Ursel provide any evidence of homegrown theories that have been kept down, and I can't think of any. And by the way, I want to make it clear that theories can be kept down, right? They can be suppressed. Uh, Carl Schmitt, who's one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, was a Nazi. Uh, he was a thoroughgoing Nazi. He was a reprehensible human being, but he was a brilliant theorist. Uh, from the end of World War II, 1945, until the middle of the 1980s, I'd say 1985, for about 40 years, his theories were suppressed, right? You, you just didn't talk about Carl Schmitt. You didn't read Carl Schmitt. That's all changed now. But you can suppress theories. So I think it's theoretically possible, plausible, that theories are being sidelined. In other words, there are homegrown theories that are invented and then they're suppressed. But I don't see any evidence of that. Now, the response that Owner and Ursel could make to me is, yes, that's true, but those theories have never been developed because the pressure to conform to the Western way of doing business and the pressure to adopt Western theories and talk in terms of Western theories is so great that all you get is imitation and no innovation. Does everybody understand that point? Because I think in very important ways, that is at the heart of their argument, right? That it's it more, it's more than the fact that there just aren't homegrown theories out there. It's that you can't develop homegrown theories and you can't develop them because the pressure to imitate the West is so great. And of course, the West is so powerful or the core is so powerful. Now, I think this is true to some extent. There is a powerful imperative to imitate. And I'll talk more about this later, but you want to understand there's a powerful imperative to imitate inside the West itself, right? But there is also a powerful imperative to innovate. Anybody who comes up 
with a clever theory or a new theory that explains things in ways that differ from the established theories is going to become awfully famous. And there are a lot of people out there who want to be famous. Right. I, I know that. I'm one of them. I, I wanted to be a major figure. And I have lots of friends over the years who wanted to be major figures in the world of international relations. I can't believe there aren't lots of people in countries like Turkey, countries like Mexico, you know, in the periphery, countries like South Africa, who want to be famous, who want to leave their mark, not in a bad way, in a good way. And you can't do that by imitating. If you imitate, you're just a ho-hum scholar. You're just imitating what everybody else does. You're following the pack. So the point I'm making to you is, yes, there is a powerful imperative to imitate, but there is also a powerful imperative to innovate, to come up with a new theory. And boy, if you came up with a non-Western theory, what um, owner and Ursula call a non-Western theory, you would really become very famous. And that theory would travel. Theory travels, right? It, the idea that it, the, the West would be able to suppress it. First of all, I don't think that's the way the West works, but you wouldn't be able to suppress it. Not with the internet anyway, not in this day and age. Uh, so anyway, I think there are no theories, uh, non-Western theories that are being suppressed, right? I think what's going on here is that the West got there first. These theories like realism were developed in the West. Uh, and uh, the West has huge amounts of resources. It's incredibly rich. It has these powerful universities and they have done an excellent job of purveying their theories all across the planet, which is why I can go to Turkey, go to Japan, go to Mexico, and talk to students the same way I talk to my students in a class at the University of Chicago. We all speak the same language. We all focus on the same body of theories and so forth and so on. It's just the way it works. I don't believe it was done uh, in a malign way. Now, let me go to the whole subject of the prospects for changing this situation, okay? Uh, whether you agree with me that we have this Western hegemony or this Anglo-Saxon hegemony for benign reasons, or you agree with Owner and Ursel that we have this Anglo-Saxon hegemony for malign reasons, there's still the question of how do we change this situation? I actually would have no problem if there were more non-Western theories. I love theory. And if non-Westerners want to develop theory, fine. As I told you, I love going to China. The Chinese are my people. We speak the same language. So it's not like I'm unhappy about the fact that non-Westerners are employing theory, uh, or would develop theory and so forth and so on. I have no problem with that. Uh, so I think if we can figure out how to fix this situation uh, so that there are more non-Western theories, that's good. And I think uh, that Owner and Ursula would agree with me on that. They surely would. Now, they spend some time in their article talking about how to improve the situation. I have a fundamental disagreement with them. I think the situation is grim for non-Western theory, and it's gonna get worse. And they're whistling in the wind when they come forward with proposals to how to fix this problem. Now you're saying, why is he saying that? Now you wanna remember before I go on, that we're talking about theorizing, right? We're talking about non-Western theories. That's their focus, that's my focus, right? And I'm telling you the situation is gonna get worse. Why is that the case? First of all, we are moving away from an emphasis on theory. Theory's privileged position in the West 
is diminishing. It's very important to understand that. And methods, empirical research, and hypothesis testing are now what scholarship and IR is all about in the West. Uh, very important for you to understand that. We teach many, many methods courses. We go to enormous lengths to socialize students, to take methods, to study methods, uh, to do empirical research. We teach hardly any theory courses. And IR theory really has a bad name at a lot of universities now. And I mean that literally. If you say I'm an IR theorist at a number of Western universities, you're considered to be a dinosaur. Many of my colleagues at elite universities in the United States think that I am a dinosaur. Uh, now, there are two reasons for this. One reason that theory is being diminished in importance is there's really not a lot new to be said. Uh, much has already been said. Uh, if you're going to write about realism, uh, it's not clear that there's a whole heck of a lot new to say. If it was 1945, it's 1945, you just got a PhD at an elite university in the United States, and you're interested in writing about IR theory, the world is your oyster, as my mother used to say. You have lots of opportunities to write interesting theoretical treatises. In the year 2022, you're following behind a lot of people who've said a lot of things about IR theory, and there's not a lot new to be said. That's one problem. The second problem is we are now in the business of mass producing PhDs. When I started graduate school in 1975, the number of PhD students who were being produced in IR, especially in security studies, was remarkably small. This is a completely different world than the world that you live in. And we now live in a world where there are huge numbers of people who want to get PhDs, right? The non-Western world is filled with young people. Many of you are on the screen here who want to get a PhD. This is wonderful, but you want to understand that that means we're mass producing PhDs. It's an assembly line. Uh, I love this phrase. This is from Owner and, uh, Owner and Ursel's piece. They talk about, quote unquote, graduate training factories graduate training factories they're exactly right we have these universities all across the planet that are graduate training factories pumping out huge numbers of phd students we have all sorts of people go into ma programs who want to then go on to get a phd once you get into mass production of phds there's going to be a heavy reliance on empirical approaches over theoretical approaches because you can't mass produce theorists. You, you can only have so many new theories. You can mass produce people who do empirical research. You give them some courses in statistics and this and that. They get spun up on methods and then they take their methods, they apply them to specific problems, they create new databases and so forth and so on. Think about a public policy school. If you're going to create a public policy school and you're going to admit 300 students a year, and those students are going to be in for two years, and you have to educate them, what kind of courses are you going to teach them? Theory courses? You think you're going to teach them to be great theorists? You think you're going to teach them to be big thinkers? No. You're going to teach them all sorts of uh, courses on methods and econometrics and so forth and so on, so they can be competent analysts when they go work for, you know, Goldman Sachs or the US government or the Turkish government or what have you. Public policy schools, right? Just look at public policy schools and how they educate people. That's what you get when you mass produce PhDs. So what I'm telling you folks is that 
the future for IR theory across the planet in the Western world and in the non-Western world is bleak because one, there's not a lot new to say. There's some, but not a lot. And number two, um, we're mass producing PhDs and, and that means uh, theory is gonna be shortchanged and empirical methods are gonna be emphasized. The other reason I think the future looks grim and the situation is going to get worse, not better, as Owner and Ursel hope, uh, has to do with the growing conformity in the West that comes out of professionalization. You want to understand that in the West, just focus on the West here. In the West, we have had a very profound movement towards professionalization since I first got into this business, really when I started graduate school in 75. So from 75 up to the present, that's a lot of years, almost 50 years. The business has become much more professionalized. That means there are all sorts of rules that you have to follow. Professionalization is really all about creating an iron cage that has rules. It demands conformity. Um, it used to be in the old days, if you submitted an article to IS, to International Security, you just write something, you'd stick it in an envelope, and you'd send it to International Security. There was no format that it had to follow. You didn't have to answer 10,000 different questions uh, in conjunction with submitting your manuscript, right? That's no longer the case. Submitting an article to International Security or any journal is a highly professionalized business, no matter where, right? And you see this in the non-Western world as well. Professional standards really matter, right? And that means conformity. That means conformity. And that conformity in the Western world is going to seep out into the non-Western world. And you can see professionalization. You folks, especially the young people, you want to think about professionalization. You want to think about what professionalization means. Political science is becoming a profession. And when a discipline like political science and IR becomes a profession, it has a narrowing, a constraining effect. Okay. And that's happening in the Western world and it's seeping out into the non Western world. And just on this point, let me conclude by saying I read uh, Ursula and Owner's piece very carefully. It's a superb piece of scholarship, even though I disagree with them on certain points. It's a superb piece of scholarship, but it is a highly professional piece in the Western sense of the term. They have written a piece that looks like something that would come out of an elite university in the United States. And of course, it was published in international theory. And when I read their piece, I see this. And by the way, it's a piece that's very empirical, very quantitative, very methods oriented. And I'm not being critical. I want to be clear. I'm not being critical of the piece. The piece is first rate, but it's not an IR theory piece. And it's very professional. And it fits neatly with my point as to the direction that we're heading in. So let me conclude by making uh, three very quick summary points. First, the West is hegemonic. Uh, Ursel and owner and I will agree on that regarding IR theory. Uh, is it malign? No, I think it's a benign process. They think it's a malign process. So there we agree. Uh, is this going to change? They're hopeful that it's going to change all for the better over time. My view is it's going to change for the worse over time. Thank you.